Um, so my name is Dr. Dabrowski and I'm a new hire in the Division of Rheumatology. And I'm gonna talk about inflammatory and non-inflammatory arthritis today. It's a pretty broad topic. So we'll give you sort of a broad overview and uh, please stop anytime for, for questions. All right, so here is our outline. So I'll give you uh, an approach for arthritis, um, a way to think about it. And we'll talk about types of inflammatory arthritis, non-inflammatory arthritis, and then go through a few cases. And there's a few questions. So whoever gets the most right, I have a small gift card for Seamless. I don't know if everybody's staying awake these days with their intern year. All right, so objectives include developing a framework to formulate a differential diagnosis for common causes of arthritis, um, understanding important clues in the history and physical that would support a particular diagnosis, and ordering appropriate lab tests um, to help you in the diagnosis, and then outlining a therapeutic approach for the more common types of arthritis. Okay, so a 30-year-old female comes to your clinic. She's been feeling really tired lately with pain and swelling in her hands. Um, and so what is your approach? All right, let's develop an approach. So one thing to keep in mind is that there are many structures around the joint. And if someone complains of arthritis, it may or may not be an actual joint problem. So you wanna think about a muscular problem, um, other soft tissue issues such as uh, tenous synovitis, um, a ligamentous issue, a bony issue, et cetera. Next is considering how many joints are involved. So monoarthritis, of course, means one joint is involved, oglo, Oligoarthritis is two to four joints, and a polyarthritis would be five or more joints. And also whether it's acute or chronic. So acute we define generally as less than six weeks, and chronic is more than six. So in terms of inflammatory versus non-inflammatory, um, are there any clues on the history that would point you towards an inflammatory cause of arthritis? If it's worse in the morning, and then gets better with like use of the joint. Yeah, exactly. That's a really important, that's probably the most important point in the history. What else? So in the chat, they mentioned, uh, Bruno mentioned swelling in erythema. Yep, definitely. What else? What about stiffness in the affected joint? Stiffness that lasts more than one hour in the morning. Exactly. So definitely more than 30 minutes, but it's usually more than one hour and sometimes even all day. So okay, Salvador mentioned range of motion. I, I'm not sure what you meant, mean, meant by that, Salvador. Yeah, so, so definitely you may pick that up on the history and also on the physical exam as well. That's really important. Okay, so, so again, like you said, more than 30 minutes of morning stiffness, pain worse in the morning and worse with breath. So a lot of patients too, they complain that when they're at work, if they have a desk job and they're sitting down, the pain gets a lot worse during the day actually when they're working. So on physical exams, so Salvador has mentioned decreased I assume decreased range of motion. Um, oh, and Ken, Ken Lamb has mentioned systemic signs such as fever, weight loss, um, which are super important to pick up for inflammatory arthritis. And there's many, many other, other features as well, systemic signs that, that we'll look for, and we can talk about them. Um, so for physical exam, aside from decreased range of motion, what, what other signs do we look for? Yeah, rashes, for sure. What else? And let's think about the joint itself. So more of a general, general findings for the joint exam. Yep, deformities, perfect. Any specific deformities that you know of? Yep, erythema, tenderness, and swelling from Victor. Perfect, Bouchard's nodes and Hubbardin's nodes, that's great. 
So those are, just to clarify for everybody, so Bouchard's are uh, over the PIP joints and Hubbardens are over the DIP joints. And a way to think about it is Bouchard's is close to the body, more proximal. And Salvador mentions tophi and nodes, that's great. So we see tophi with gout and you can see nodules with um, RA and other diseases as well. All right, ulnar deviation with RA perfect, great. Okay, so exactly. So warm, erythematous, and decreased range of motion. And what about, and then deformities, like you mentioned, I missed that one. Um, so what about for labs? What sort of labs will be ordered for concern about an inflammatory arthritis? Yeah, so I'm getting from a lot of people, Neha, Sidra, um, so ESR and CRP, definitely. And these are generally elevated, although not universally. So it does not rule out an inflammatory arthritis. Perfect. And so we're also getting from uh, Nadim and from Bruno, so ANA, RF, anti-CCP. And that's great. So if you're seeing other signs and symptoms of, say, lupus, for example, or RA, then you'd order those specific tests. What about synovial fluid analysis? What would we expect on that? Yep, high WBCs from Victor, perfect. And specifically, there's a cutoff. So how high will we expect it? Anybody? Not as high as a septic joint. 50,000 is a guess from Bruno. So not as high as a septic joint. So that's not, that's actually not true. So let's talk about that for a second. So anything above 2000 is considered inflammatory. And so any type of inflammatory arthritis should be considered when you get a WBC count above 2000. So that's really important. That's a good board question too. You'll probably get asked that. Okay, so, so again, synovial analysis, WBC is greater than 2000. And kind of counterintuitively, you actually get a thinner consistency in the synovial fluid when it's inflammatory. So when it's healthy, it's actually nice and thick. Um, so you'll see that if you do an arthrocentesis with us. And then we'll do additional testing dependent on the etiology. Okay, so more helpful patterns. So we look at whether it's symmetric versus asymmetric. And that's because, you know, there's it follows certain diseases. So for example, RA or SLE tends to be symmetric. So with RA, you often get wrist, MCP, and PIP involvement on both sides. And same with lupus. Whereas a seronegative arthritis or crystal arthritis, it tends to be asymmetric. And also looking at proximal versus distal joints. So gout, for example, tends to be more distal and affecting the, the toes, the MTP joints. You want to look at as well if it's a, just a single event, such as, you know, a reactive arthritis, which is acute, or Lyme versus intermittent episodes such as gout, and if it's migratory versus additive. Um, so migratory pattern would be something like a gonorrhea arthritis versus RA, which would be additive. Okay, so we're going to talk about types of inflammatory arthritis. So here's your differential. So first to consider is a crystal arthritis. And primarily this includes pseudogout, um, which is also known as calcium pyrophosphate disease or CPPD versus gout. And next you, you should consider a connective tissue disorder. So as you know, many of you have already mentioned, you think about things like RA, Sjogren's, lupus, scleroderma, also known as systemic sclerosis, mixed connective tissue disorder, undifferentiated connective tissue disorder, vasculitis, and inflammatory myopathies. So there's many types of connective tissue disorders. We'll go through a few of them today. Also think about seronegative arthritis. Oh, and this is also known as um, SPA. So ankylosing spondylitis, or AS, psoriatic arthritis, PSA, reactive arthritis, and enteropathic arthritis, as well as undifferentiated. 
And that just means that a patient does not meet criteria for any of the other arthritis. Infectious arthritis is, of course, under differential for any acute monoarthritis, as well as select um, polyarthritis, um, and also miscellaneous. There's many additional types of inflammatory arthritis, which we won't really get into today. All right, so gout. Gout is the most common inflammatory arthritis when you include both acute and chronic causes. And it simply means monosodium urate crystal deposition. So you can see here, this is, uh, these are topi in this picture, and that's directly, it's just monosodium urate crystals. And if you aspirate at that topus, you don't really have a great need to do that, so I wouldn't recommend it, but you would see MSU crystals. Um, and it's associated with the metabolic syndrome, renal dysfunction. And podagra, which is synovitis of the first MTP, is pathognomonic of gout. So for your workup, you should get BMP uric acid, x-rays of all the affected joints, and you should do an arthrocentesis. Patients can present with both gout and an infection at the same time, and we see this not infrequently. Your uric acid goal is less than six, and if the patient has topi, such as this patient here, you want to target a uric acid of less than five. In terms of needing uric acid lowering treatment, most patients do. So if they're having recurrent flares, if they have CKD or TOFI, you're going to start treatment. Generally, we start allopurinol. It's an excellent treatment. It's cheap. Most patients tolerate it. Um, and so you actually can start allopurinol during a flare. That's really important because a lot of patients, there's a missed opportunity in a hospital with, you know, with an acute gout flare. So starting that medication right away is very important. And you can cover with prednisone or colchicine or NSAIDs. Never stop the allopurinol. This is a common misconception with a lot of patients. So, so really counsel them on not stopping it. And it can save, I think, quite a few hospitalizations. And here's some really nice MSU crystals down here, which are spearing through WBCs. Okay, so we do have, um, rec we do have guidelines from the ACR. Um, for the management of gout. So if you're ever unsure, you can go to the guidelines and, and look up the management. All right, so, so coming over here, so crystal arthritis. So on the right-hand side, you can see these really well demarcated erosions right here next to the joint line. And these are also known as rat bite erosions um, just because of their appearance. And, and that's char characteristic of gout. Here in the middle x-ray, you can see calcification of the cartilage, and this is chondrocalcinosis. And this is characteristic of CPPD. On the left-hand side, we see a bit of a different pattern. And there's periarticular um, osteopenia. And this is very characteristic of RA in particular, but can be seen in other types of inflammatory arthritis as well. Okay, so in terms of pseudo gout, um, a really important pearl is that it's actually easier to miss these crystals. They're harder to see on microscopy, and I often go and look up the crystals myself if I'm concerned for CPPD. So you can miss up to 20% of the time. So that's quite a few patients. It tends to be a disease of older adults greater than 50 years. And for your workup, you want to look at BMP, PTH, TSH, vitamin D phosphate, mag, and x-rays of all the affected joints. And if you find an abnormal PTH or TSH you're going, or vitamin D, you're going to want to treat that, and that will help prevent recurrent episodes. There's many different subtypes of CPPD, which I think, you know, at least I wasn't aware as a resident. So you can actually have an acute uh, phase, which we do often see in hospital, where a patient comes in with a mono or oligoarticular arthritis, um, but you can also get a more chronic uh, arthritis as well in a pseudo RA picture. So patients with, you know, the seronegative RA may actually have a chronic pseudo gout. And so that's really important to look for because the treatment is different. Some patients do have chondrocalcinosis on x-ray but are asymptomatic. And you can also get sort of this pseudo OA picture where the crystals and the inflammation can wear down that cartilage and you wind up with this sort of atypical secondary OA. 
So prophylaxis is colchicine. Um, and you want to start prophylaxis if they're having recurrent flares or any joint damage. And the treatment for acute attacks would be colchicine steroids or NSAIDs. Okay, so in terms of RA, um, so this is a chronic polyarticular symmetric inflammatory arthritis. And it's the most common type of chronic inflammatory arthritis. And the classic presentation is wrist, MCP, and PIP bilateral synovitis. However, feet are often one of the first places to show erosions. In this picture over here, you can see that the patient's toes are splayed. And this indicates that the um, MTPs are quite swollen. And so in terms of your workup, you're going to get inflammatory markers, CCP and RF, um, CBC, CMP, and x-rays of all the affected joints. At minimum, you're going to want to get the C-spine because it can affect the spine and it can cause atlanoaxial instability, as I think we all know, um, hands, wrists, feet, and ankles. And interestingly, the CCP actually tends to be positive first and then the RF. So it's important to check both. So key to treatment is that early and aggressive therapy has been shown to be very, very important. So now that we have really incredible medications, you're going to retarget remission or low disease activity. And there are many different disease activity markers that you can use um, and always use an app. You would never need to, to memorize these disease activity markers. So RA patients are really high risk of cardiovascular disease. And so it's important to, to aggressively modify their risk factors. So many deformities can be seen with RA patients. And so these are a couple of examples. So this is a claw toe deformity and a hammer toe. Patients with OTRA can get these as well. So in terms of uh, hand deformities, this is very severe. We don't see this as much anymore now that we have biologics for treatment. Um, so you're seeing boutonniere deformity of the thumb here, um, ulnar deviation. So you're, you're deviating at the MCPs over to the ulna. You can also get swan neck deformity. So it's hyperextension of the PIPs and then flexion of the DIPs. And boutonniere is the opposite. So most patients that we see will have more subtle findings. So you can tell here that this patient has some swelling of the PIP joint and it's a little bit red. She has a little abrasion here, but she also has some swelling of the MCP as well. And it looks like she smokes. Smoking is actually a very important risk factor for, for RA, and it's actually been shown to worsen outcomes. So it's super important for any of these patients for both their cardiovascular risk and also their RA to, for smoking cessation. And again, we have up-to-date guidelines from the ACR, which are um, great, they're very straightforward. So I'd recommend looking at these if you have any RA patients. So treatment. So if you see a patient with RA, you can start treatment and refer to rheumatology. So that way there's no delay in, in the treatment. If they have an acute flare, as they often do at first presentation, you really should start a bit of prednisone. I recommend about 15 milligrams a day and it will work right away. The first line of treatment is methotrexate. And again, the dose is 15 milligrams but weekly with daily folic acid, if there are no contraindications. If there are, or if methotrexate fails, there are a couple of options. You could do triple therapy, so you would add sulfasalazine and plaquenil, or you could try a biologic, such as a TNF inhibitor. Generally, you'd want room help for that. Um, monitor the disease activity, like I mentioned, with these tools, including CDI, SDI, or DAS28, and you can use an app for that. All RA patients should be referred to a room. So in terms of lupus, the arthritis is a little bit different. So you tend to get actually a non-erosive arthritis, which can cause ligamentous laxity. And this is called Jacquard's arthropathy, as you can see here. So these are swan neck deformities, but they're actually reducible. And we actually had a patient recently on the inpatient service with this, and it was pretty impressive. And the synovitis, it's often more subtle than with RA. Um, for the workup, as a few of you have mentioned before, you're gonna get an ANA. And then also more specific markers, including DSDNA, SMITH. Um, RNP tends to go along with lupus as well. Uh, C3, C4, CH50, which is an overall marker of complement, as well as CBC and Coombs, antiphospholipid testing, um, CMP, and urine studies, so UA and urine protein to creatinine ratio. 
we tend to treat flares with sort of low to moderate dose prednisone of 10 to 15 milligrams daily. And treatments for lupus arthritis include Plaquenil, which all lupus patients should be on a baseline, as well as azathioprine, methotrexate, or belimumab. Um, that the other name for belimumab is Benlista. And notably, mycophenolate is not effective for arthritis. You always have to be super careful of a lupus patient coming in with an acute arthritis flare because we need to rule out infection. It's always high on our list. So systemic sclerosis um, and versus the localized version, which is called scleroderma. Um, so this is a multi-system disorder which can cause inflammatory arthritis, but it can also affect any organ system. Up here on the right, you can see this patient has sclerodactyly and she has multiple areas of calcinosis and even um, some ulcerations as well. Here you can see a scleroderma patient with an abnormal, abnormal nail fold exam. And so you're seeing all of these dilated capillary loops at the nail bed. Here, there's a finding of acro osteolysis. So this patient has actually lost the distal tip of their fingers and you wind up with digital shortening. It's very impressive. And I've seen it a couple of times. So unique hand findings, like I mentioned, is sclerodactyly, acroosteolysis, um, calcinosis. And a lot of the pain can actually be from the skin thickening and not from mature arthritis. And it's a less common feature actually than, than the other findings in scleroderma. Almost all patients with scleroderma have her nodes. So that's something to, to look for. In terms of our workup, in addition to ANA, we're going to check centromere, RNA polymerase, um, SCL70, as well as your routine labs and urine studies. And we also check a chest x-ray, PFTs, ECG, echo, and BNP, because we want to screen for, for internal organ involvement. And the treatment's really based on which organs are involved. And that's beyond this talk. So in terms of MCTD, so these patients present with symptoms of both lupus and scleroderma. And for the diagnosis, you really need um, RNP and Raynaud's phenomenon. So you can see here this great example of Raynaud's. So you have this abrupt cutoff um, with discoloration distal to the cutoff. So this patient's fingers are turning white. And the, the classic finding is that the fingers turn white and then blue and then red upon reforming. Any patients with MCTD need an echo check because the RNP antibody confers a higher risk of pulmonary hypertension. And otherwise the workup is seen as lupus. UCTD simply means that the patient does not meet criteria for any one disease, but you do suspect they have a connective tissue disorder. There are also overlap symptoms or syndromes. So this would be patients that don't, that meet full criteria for more than one condition. An example of a common overlap syndrome is RA and SLE. Okay, so in terms of seronegative arthritis, um, this is an example of ankylosing spondylitis. So this patient has pretty pronounced kyphosis, as you can see. So if you were to do an occiput to wall test, this would be very, very abnormal. So the hallmarks are sacroiliitis and enthesitis. So endocytis means inflammation at the point of insertion for tendons and ligaments onto bone. Many patients, about one quarter will have uveitis and about 7% will go on to develop IBD. And so recall features of inflammatory back pain from med school. Um, does anyone know features of inflammatory back pain? Any takers? Chiefs, can you call on someone? <laughs> I did. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, I see Juan is on the call. Okay, Bruno is saying worse in the morning and waking up in the middle of the night. Very good. So waking up in the middle of the night or overnight pain is very common in AS. So that's an important symptom to look for. What else? Bamboo spine. Yep, exactly. Morning stiffness, better with activity. Yep. Does anyone know what a bamboo spine is? I know that treatment is NSAIDs, yep. Dagger spine. Fusion of the iliac spine to make it 
Yeah, exactly. So, so you get fusion. So you get these bridging uh, syndesmophytes and like calcification all the way up the spine, and it eventually looks like bamboo. Thankfully, we have great treatments now, so that does not happen as often. And fusion of the vertebral bodies. Yeah, exactly. So these bridging um, calcified syndesmophytes. And so the workup is, oh, and other features for AS include you can have alternating buttock pain as well. And you're going to have, you know, maybe a Faber sign that's positive. You may have a positive Schober's uh, test as well. So that's measuring the flexion of your lumbar spine um, when, you, when you go from the, um, forgetting the words, anyway, the, the dimples of Venus, and then you measure five centimeters down, and then you want to see an excursion of five centimeters. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of the workup, so you're going to check inflammatory markers, HLA B27, um, routine labs, and then x-rays. If the x-ray does not show changes that you expect, you can go on to get an MRI because it's more sensitive. So here, so go down to the x-ray picture. So it looks like these SI joints are essentially fused. So this would be diagnostic of sacroiliitis. It's really important to, to discuss, you know, if you're not really sure with the radiologist, because other things such as pregnancy, obesity, um, you know, mechanical stress can cause changes in the SI joints, which may or may not be uh, sacroiliitis. So HLA B27 is present in most white AS patients, but only about half of non-white. So that's really important. So if you're seeing a patient um, who's Caucasian and their HLA B27 is negative, it's actually pretty good to rule out the disease. But it's not diagnostic. So only 5% of people with HLA B27 conversely will have AS. So as somebody already mentioned, first line is NSAIDs for treatment. And then you'll move on to a TNF inhibitor if that is ineffective. It's really important that, to note that most oral DMARDs are not effective for axial disease. They will not work. And of course, we do need a good latent infection workup before starting a TNF inhibitor. Okay, so does anyone know what this finding is? It's here. So I think Bruno is saying tendonitis. Yep, exactly. So this is Achilles tendonitis. So you can see the fullness here. So this is an AS patient. Good. I think uh, I think Bruno is going to get that gift card. Um, okay, enteropathic arthritis. So this occurs in about one quarter of IBD patients, especially those with UC and extensive colon involvement. Um, peripheral involvement or peripheral arthritis, so hands, toes, knees, sometimes correlates with bowel disease activity, but axial disease, so spine disease, does not. And autoimmune hepatitis can also be associated with spa symptoms as well as celiac. They're less commonly axial and more commonly peripheral. And the treatments for IBD and arthritis tend to overlap, notably TNF inhibitors. We cannot use IL-17 inhibition, which can worsen uh, IBD. And that's beyond the scope again of this talk. You, would, you wouldn't need to do that independently. Um, Okay, so psoriatic arthritis. So psoriatic arthritis is really interesting. So this is when psoriasis and um, you know, a spa occurs together. So you can, just like the other types of spa, get uveitis, bowel disease, and you can be positive for HLA B27. Unique to spa, you see more dactylitis. So this would be an entire digit being swollen, such as a finger or a toe. And you can get these characteristic pencil and cup changes on the x-ray. So here, this is one, it's kind of small, but this purple circle is, uh, is pointing to a pencil and cup deformity. So you're seeing really, really destruction of this uh, DIP joint. And, and what winds up happening is you have this tiny little portion of bone on, on the end of the digit, and then this sort of cup appearance of the, uh, of the phalanx below. And this is an example of arthritis mutilans. So this is a complete destruction of many of the PIP and, and DIP joints. And it's, it's quite impressive in person to see. 
So we try to avoid this and start treatment as early as possible. So PSA is associated with metabolic syndrome and increased CVS risk, just like RA. So your workup will actually include ARF and CCP because you really won't, do want to rule out RA. Of course, you will see a different distribution. So DIP involvement is very uncommon in RA, where it's common in psoriatic arthritis. You're going to get x-rays of the entire spine, hands, feet, and any other affected joints, as well as inflammatory markers and infectious workup. I should mention that inflammatory markers are not universally elevated for a seronegative arthritis. They're often, they can often be normal. So again, that does not rule it out. And you're going to treat in conjunction with dermatology. Many of these patients respond really, really well to TNFs um, and other biologics as well. So here you can see a dactylitis. So this right second toe is diffusely inflamed. And then he has psoriatic changes in the nails as well, which can be sometimes difficult to differentiate from a fungal infection. So treatment, we have guidelines again for the treatment of PSA. And you'll always want to combine non-pharmacological treatments with um, medication. So PT, OT, smoking cessation, weight loss, exercise are all very important. Um, so massage therapy is recommended um, for some things, but um, it's, it's not routinely recommended, at least in our practice. NSAIDs um, are great symptomatic treatments, as well as glucocorticoids. We actually avoid Plaquenil because it has been shown to exacerbate uh, psoriatic lesions. And then these are the biologics that, and the other DMARs that we tend to use in PSA. So reactive arthritis is also considered a seronegative arthritis, and it's sterile. So you're not going to isolate a pathogen in the synovial fluid. And it tends to occur about one to four weeks after a GI or GU uh, infection. And these are some common infections that can trigger a reactive arthritis. And I think the classic mnemonic that we probably all learned is that can't see, can't pee, and can't climb a tree um, to help remember the constellation of symptoms with reactive arthritis. It's also associated with HLA-B27. And when this occurs, the patients tend to have a, a worse course. So about half of patients will have a self-limited course over a few months, and then it will go away and not come back. And about 30% will have recurrent, and 20% will have chronic, requiring ongoing immunosuppression. And we can treat with NSAIDs, steroids, or immunosuppressives. So a few miscellaneous things. So this is a patient with Sappho syndrome. Has anyone heard of Sappho syndrome? I wouldn't really expect you to, but if you have, great. So this stands for synovitis, acne, pustulosis, hyperostosis, and osteitis. So these patients tend to get really severe osteoarthritic changes in their hands, and they get the sterile osteomyelitis really interesting to see. I had a few patients when I used to work in the Bronx that have had Sappho syndrome and it's, it's pretty challenging to treat. So it's just another thing to think about when you're, when you're seeing a patient with inflammatory arthritis that looks sort of like OA. And this is another sort of more rare condition. So this is RS3PE, or remitting seronegative symmetric synovitis with pitting edema. It's way too long a name, which is why it's abbreviated. So these patients tend to present with sort of this RA picture, but their hands are diffusely swollen and it's, they have pitting edema. It's very distinct. Um, and they tend to do well with chronic immunosuppressive treatment. And sarcoid arthropathy is also, it's more, much more common than the last two I just spoke about. And so these patients tend to get dactylitis, tenosynovitis, such as this patient here, um, this patient has a wrist extensor tenosynovitis, and they can also get these really impressive cyst-like changes in their, on their x-rays, and also this lacy-like pattern as well in their bones. And so we treat with uh, NSAIDs and prednisone. It's very responsive, and if that doesn't work, then we move on to methotrexate or other things. All right, so non-inflammatory arthritis. So primary OA is known as degenerative arthritis or sort of this wear and tear arthritis. But recent evidence actually shows that inflammation does play a role. 
Um, and you can get this erosive OA where the bones or the joints do show erosive changes. And secondary OA is uh, when you get joint damage or cartilage destruction, and it's secondary to another cause. So these are causes such as inflammatory arthritis, but also rare things like opnosis, hemochromatosis, and trauma. So this is a cartoon. It's just going through some of the mechanisms and, and risk factors. So aging, obesity, trauma, excessive load, uh, metabolic syndrome, genetic predisposition, and gender and hormone profile as well. Um, so eventually you get, you get an extracellular matrix degradation and you, you wind up with actually cartilage hypertrophy initially. And then over time that breaks down um, and it's essentially you cannot replace it and, and you'll eventually get bone on bone um, away. So there's many inflammatory markers that are involved um, in cytokines, but I think that's beyond this talk. All right, so this is a patient with severe hand OA. So as somebody mentioned earlier, these are Bouchard's nodes over the PIP joints. And these are Hepburn's nodes over the VIP joints. This is a pretty characteristic uh, knee x-ray. So here we're seeing pretty bad um, medial joint space narrowing. That's very severe. And you're seeing some subchondral bone sclerosis as well. And there's probably some cystic changes in there as well. And lo and behold, there is also guidelines for this. So we, we like to be evidence-based in rheumatology. So again, if you ever have a question about management, you can go to the guidelines. They're really great. So from the guidelines, um, you can see that they've divided it based on hand, knee, and hip, which are probably the most common types of OA. Exercise is the cornerstone. There's many mechanisms as to why exercise helps, um, which we won't get into today, but it's super important. Weight loss, Tai Chi, canes, bracing, um, these can be prescribed by OT. OT is really, really helpful. And then other things as well, which may or may not be helpful, such as therapeutic heating and cooling, cognitive behavioral therapy, acupuncture, taping, and balance training. Yoga, paraffin, other hand arthrosis has, have also been shown to be helpful, but maybe less clear. Oral NSAIDs are very helpful. The problem is a lot of our patients with severe OA tend to have comorbidities, so that can be a challenge. So I use topical NSAIDs for OA all the time. It does not work in the hip, it's too deep of a joint, but for the hands um, and for the knee, it's quite good. We do steroid injections and it does help, However, you know, the response is pretty variable. And I think, I, at least for me personally, I tend to do other things and give steroids as more of a second line. And we do actually see some benefit with duloxetine as well. And so this I use as a third line treatment for my patients. I've never had a patient tell me that acetaminophen has helped their OA, but it is in the guideline. All right, so things that do not work. Bisphosphonates, glucosamine, plaquenil, methotrexate, and other, um, and other immunosuppressants, even though there is an inflammatory component to OA, they are not effective for OA pain. So these are definitely not recommended. Okay, I'm just checking the time. So we have a couple of cases to go through, and then we'll wrap up. So the case of Mr. Pavegra. So a 42-year-old male limps into the ED. He's had severe pain in his right first MTP for one day, constant pain, and he's otherwise feeling okay. So what is your approach to determine if it's inflammatory versus non-inflammatory? And anyone participate? We went over this during the lecture, except uh, Juan says he would assess if you would be able to tap. Very good. Always try and tap anytime you have a monoarthritis. Well, there's a caveat, I guess, in this case. What else? We went over the characteristics of inflammatory versus non-inflammatory pain in, in the beginning, right? We did, we did. Okay, let's go back to this to the slides. 
So is the problem truly in a joint? I think it is. It's super red, right over the joint. First MTP. Yep, you want to think about infection for sure. And it's a monoarthritis, it's one joint, and it's acute, so under six weeks. So in terms of this person, it's it's stiff kind of all day, so maybe, and it pain is not really better or worse with breast. So it's a little bit of a different case, but it's certainly warm erythematous and you can't move it. If we were to do synovial fluid analysis, it probably would be inflammatory is my guess. Yes, crystal arthropathy. So Victor, why do you say crystal arthropathy? Um, first, the involvement of one joint only, and this is a characteristic joint in addition to the need to be involved in um, gout, most likely the acute presentation of the patient. Um, it looks, <laughs> this is a typical presentation of gout. Exactly. So it's um, so sudden onset and the distribution, it's this monoarthritis in the toe. It's it's actually, you know, pathognomonic for gout, known as pedagger when you have first MTP synovitis. Um, so on exam, he's also noted to have this. Does anyone know what this is? Tofi, yeah, exactly. So this patient does have some tofi, but there's also something else. Yes. So it's a bursitis, that's excellent. So he has some tophi and it's also a bursitis. So lacrinine bursitis is super common in gout. Okay, so what are we gonna do for workup? Tap, yeah, so you can tap the elbow and you can look for MSU crystals. You don't have to, if you're worried about the elbow, like if, if it's actually in the joint in addition to the bursitis, you would definitely tap that for sure. The toe, you do not have to tap because that's podagra. X-ray, serum, uric acid, BMP, perfect. Yep, exactly. And what will we treat him with? NSAIDs, perfect. And he's otherwise healthy. Yep, colchicine is good. Prednisone is fine too. These all work. And what about allopurinol? Yay. Okay, so what are... We'll just see no. <laughs> so what are our indications for starting allopurinol? Do you remember? Allopurinol, no. Okay. Bruno, you feel very strongly. So why, why would you not start? Good, yeah. So if it's recurrent, you got it. And what is the other indication for starting allopurinol? If TOFI, perfect. And he does have TOFI, good. What else? There's one more thing that's important. CKD, perfect. Yep, excellent. Okay. So arthrocentesis, not necessary because pedagra is pathognomonic, but we did see the elbow, it's a bursa. So plus minus arthrocentesis. Uric acid is 9.6 and his GFR is 80. So that's pretty good. Uh, and we do an X-ray of his feet. So acute treatment, as you mentioned, NSAIDs, colchicine, or prednisone. And we would start uric acid lowering therapy because he has TOFI. And what is our target for, for uric acid for this guy? Five, fabulous. So below six without TOFI and below five with TOFI. So his will be below five. Um, and low purine diet, what does that mean? No meat. Less meats, <laughs> yes. No meat is probably unrealistic for most people, um, but red meat is something to avoid in particular in shellfish. So shrimps, yes, alcohol, but especially beer is super important. And sugary foods, drinks, weight loss, lifestyle changes are, are actually really gonna help a lot. One of my patients is adamant that he's going to get in good enough shape where he doesn't need allopurinol. And his uric acid actually did drop from about eight to seven. So I thought that was pretty impressive. Regardless, he's still going to need allopurinol. So most, most patients really do need allopurinol. And diet alone and lifestyle changes don't cut it. And then you can refer to room. You can follow these patients. We're happy to do it. So, okay, this is his x-ray. This is a rat bite erosion. Sorry, that's a little corny. But you can see, again, these sclerotic, really well, well, maybe not this one, but most of them are really well-defined. 
And you can see pretty bad joint space narrowing here. I think this is a first MTP. All right, Ms. Wolf. So Ms. Wolf is 33 and she's coming in with pain in her hands and her knees for about two months. And she recently had an awful loss of pregnancy at 26 weeks. And this has been her first pregnancy. She's been losing hair, which she thought was from the pregnancy. And she's had sort of this low grade fever. She doesn't have any chest pain, rashes, headaches, or other complaints and no anemia or other blood issues. Sometimes she has dry mouth, um, but really no change in her uh, texture of her skin. She does note her nose or the color changing in her hands when she goes outside or gets things from the fridge or freezer. She's noticed, even though she doesn't have any rashes now, she's had a really bad burn over the past few summers, which is unusual because she tanned easily as a child. And so this is the picture she took from last summer on her arm and on her neck. And that's a picture of her hand. So on exam, she actually looks pretty well, aside from some diffuse uh, and patchy hair thinning. Blood pressure is good. Um, she has no active skin lesions. Her hair is thinning, like I mentioned. Her oral mucosa was healthy, um, no product swelling. Lungs and heart, belly were unremarkable. And she has some synovitis on exam. So she has some fullness of her PIPs. They're a little bit tender, um, but nothing is super warm or swollen. Um, she can't really make a fist. Um, and she can't squeeze your finger. No nodules sub subcutaneously. All right, so is her problem in a joint? Yes, no, maybe. Not solely, yeah. So she has, sounds like she has a joint problem, but also other stuff going on. Okay, we're saying no from Kuti. Sorry if I said that wrong. All right, and how many joints are involved? Is it mono, oligo, or polyarthritis? Okay, so we have a vote for oligo from one. Any other votes? Poly. Yeah, I'm gonna go with um, poly as well. So she has her wrists, multiple MCPs, PIPs, her ankles were tender. So I think it's a, it's a polyarthritis. And is it acute or chronic? Yeah, it's a chronic. Perfect. Good job. And inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Yep, it's inflammatory, right? So pain is worse in the morning. She's, you know, stiff. It's, you know, better with, not better with, um, um, rest it's worse with rest and she does have some swelling even though her range of motion is okay she can't really make a fist so you can see how it's not always you know black or white um, with these with these guidelines so if we were to do a synovial fluid analysis it would probably be greater than 2000 but probably not hugely greater than 2000. and we're again we're seeing this symmetric polyarthritis so thinking more ra or lupus um, as opposed to a crystal or, or seronegative. And the joints are more proximal and it's a chronic, chronic episode and additive as opposed to migratory. So her labs, so her ANA, sorry, I jumped the gun with, with getting the uh, labs ordered, but her ANA is very positive. So one in 640 homogeneous. Her DSDNA is positive, her Smith is positive, RNP and Rho are positive. Complements are low. And she has negative topoisomerase, which is also known as SCL70, negative centromere. And she has positive anti-cardiolipin antibodies. Um, sort of this borderline anemia and uh, mildly low platelet count as well. And she has a little bit of protein in her urine. So let's actually talk about this for a minute. So what um, what are we concerned about in addition to her arthritis? Because it's probably more important actually than, than her arthritis. Even though I know it's not a lupus talk, that's kind of what I get excited about. So what are some red flags kind of on her blood work? Yeah, lupus nephritis. I'm really worried about that. Yep. 
exactly. So she has red blood cells, Cas, and protein. That's super concerning. So what would you do for further workup for her? Renal biopsy, you got it. Oh shoot, we got four minutes left. Um, all right, I'll speed it up. Um, what else? What about her anti-cardiolipin antibody is in her history of loss at uh, 26 weeks? What does she have in addition to lupus, presumably? Yeah, so she needs criteria for antiphospholipid syndrome. So she's going to need lifelong anticoagulation if she goes on to develop a blood clot. Um, and she will require anticoagulation for any pregnancies. Referral to heme. One other thing I'd like to point out before we're going to have to wrap up a bit early, RNP is strongly positive. She is going to need an echo. Okay, so we're going to want to screen for pulmonary hypertension as well. And also has strongly positive row, and she has some sicka symptoms, so she's going to need good follow-up by dentistry and ortho. Okay, we're going to skip this for the time being. Um, we don't have time for the other cases, but some more pictures. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. I'd like to know if you have any questions. Um, so in summary, our inflammatory arthritis differential is broad and it includes crystal arthritis, connective tissue disorders. Patients can have more than one, so, so you want to screen for, for multiple. Um, seronegative arthritis, infectious, and also miscellaneous or some more rare conditions. You want to determine the etiology of inflammatory arthritis by looking at all of the non-articular symptoms. Um, Non-inflammatory arthritis is osteoarthritis, but it still has some elements of inflammation. So as a medicine resident, you're going to complete an initial workup and consider initial treatment while you're waiting for rheumatology, and then refer for any type of inflammatory arthritis. And again, to go back, our approach is always looking at the number of joints involved, uh, chronicity, um, you know, inflammatory versus non-inflammatory features, and that'll go a really long way towards your diagnosis. And again, it's not really straightforward, so um, it's okay to, you know, take your time and, and get some help from your room colleagues. So if you like to read, ACR guidelines are fantastic. They also have this huge image bank, which is great for morning report or rounds. Um, room Secrets is really good. So it's super accurate, concise, and you can get it online. And nature reviews of rheumatology are also great too. If you don't like to read or you're too tired, roomtutor.com is fantastic. It's out of McMaster University back in Canada, and they have injection techniques, MSK exam tips, et cetera. The Rumor Helper app is awesome. So you can download it and you can just point and click and decide if a patient meets criteria for, for different diagnoses. Um, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>